Hey, how you doing? This is RJ. So today's video is entitled Facts Don't Care About Your Feelings. Now I did a video with that title probably a couple of years ago, so I guess this would be the second installment of that. And part of the reason why I'm doing a second video on this is because, well, over the last couple of days I saw a video of Candace Owen and she was giving a talk at a university somewhere and the people asking questions, one of them came up to her and said, there are people of the alphabet community who feel threatened by your presence here. What do you have to say to those people? And without missing a beat, she said, life's tough, get a helmet. Next question. And this is the slow advancement of that idea of the facts don't care about your feelings. We've thankfully finally gotten to the point where we can be just plain blunt about it. And that's kind of what I'm going to do today. I'm going to go into some very blunt facts. One of them being that since I cover comics and entertainment, using comics as basically the microcosm for the entertainment industry and how it works, there's a lot of other people in this space who think that older industries like the comic industry can be revived. And I'm really not of that opinion at all. And I'll go into some of that today, but really they're just going to have to die in their present form. But the other blunt fact that I'm going to go over is that if we actually want to build something new that works better and is not going to be subject to this self-same degradation, we have to watch out on our side of the aisle to make sure we don't fall into the same ideological traps that the people in this quote-unquote progressive system have dug themselves into and just can't get out of. Because... You can see in some spaces that that's what we're doing. Some people are becoming right ideologues and we need to get away from that. That's why I always concentrate on logic and reason and the traditional idea of a hero which is based upon reality. These are the things we need to emphasize even though they might not be as flashy as you might like. And that's kind of the topic of today's video because it's about reality and reality doesn't care about your feelings. And talking about building a new system of entertainment, there are two links in the description and on the pinned comment for my three graphic novels, my two superhero graphic novels, The Valiant Heroes and Thomas Valiant, which focus on the traditional idea of a hero, down in the dirt, gritty, trying to build yourself up as a hero in an unforgiving world. Those can both be ordered through the Valiant Heroes Indiegogo site and my return to form for low fantasy, which is Crom the Destroyer, which is about death and honor, where an aging king looks for an honorable death on the battlefield, but is drawn into a much larger conflict that he cannot, in good conscience, through his honor, ignore. So if any of that looks or sounds appealing to you at all, because you're looking at some of the art for those in the background, then click on those links in the description and go on over and order yourself a copy of one of my graphic novels today. But back to my topic. So before I get into the nitty gritty of the statements made by some writers of entertainment, mostly comic writers, but they do other things as well, let's look at the difference between the idea of depending first upon your feelings or upon the facts. That is to say, upon reality. Because really, that's what Candace Owen was alluding to when she said, life's tough, get a helmet. Because the girl came up and said, people are feeling threatened by you and your presence here and what you have to say. So the difference between those two states of mind is everything for the person who's asking the question is about the individual, is about me, 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 and my feelings. And what Candace Owen is saying is, it's not all about you, it's about reality. Reality is what it is, and you're going to have to deal with it, your feelings, and you don't come first. All right, so I listened to a bunch of interviews with writers, mostly comic writers, over the last week. I was searching for something I didn't find, but nonetheless, I did glean something from listening to these interviews for people who work mostly in the mainstream comic industry. Some of them are also showrunners and things like that, so it does overlap with television and other kinds of media. But the thing was that the first one that I want to focus on is Jonathan Hickman. Now, he just gave an interview with Marvel.com. It's a fairly short interview. I think it's about half an hour. But he talks about his new series, Gods. And he does touch on a little bit of what he has written for Marvel already. But here's the thing in the interview that really struck me. His statement was that what Marvel he thinks, again, he does put it in these terms, saying that maybe I'm completely wrong on this and someone at Marvel should correct me, but I don't think they ever will. But his thought is that he was hired by Marvel as a writer to always swing for the fences. And if sometimes that doesn't work, well, he tried. 
And as long as he tried to swing for the fences, well, maybe someone will pick it up later on and make a good story out of it, etc., etc. Now, I thought about this for a second because it really irked me when I heard that. And why? Well, because, really, what Marvel Comics was built on and good storytelling is built on, it doesn't matter if it's television, movies, whatever, is not swinging for the fences. It's Moneyball. Now, very briefly, what is Moneyball for those people who don't know a lot about sports or baseball? Well, the actual definition is Moneyball is a data-driven management approach to a business which aims at getting the maximum value possible out of your investment. And one of the great managers of a Moneyball team added to this saying, we are ultimately trying to find undervalued assets and hope that the player value would continue to increase. Now, I'm sure if you confronted someone from Disney or Marvel and said, you should be playing Moneyball, not swinging for the fences every time someone gets up to bat, they would say, sure, that's what we're doing. We're trying to get these undervalued assets and bring them up so that they become more and more valuable and thus get the most out of our investment. But really, that's not what they're doing. Why? You can see it exactly in Jonathan Hickman's statement. Because when you play Moneyball, you don't swing for the fences. Quite literally, if you take all of the strategy for Moneyball, you quite literally never swing for the fences. What you do is every time a batter gets up, they need to hit either a single or a double. Just simple, plain singles are fine. Why? Because the whole point is to drive everybody around the bases over and over again so that you win the freaking game. And someone might say, well, that's not entertaining. That is not what people are going to pay money for. Well, I would argue that if you look at the history of baseball, you can see the shift exactly from everybody swinging for the fences to Moneyball very simply, and people actually paid more for Moneyball than for people swinging for the fences. Why? Because the point being that you need to win the game, and then you started to get teams which would start to win game after game after game until you had teams which were winning 20 games in a row and the point being that they drew in more and more people every time saying, is this the next game they're going to win or are they going to lose finally? That was the entertainment. It was a buildup of not just this moment, this pitch, this swing, but this game, this team, this season. And so it drew people more and more into the entertainment of baseball. And quite honestly, that's the way Marvel Comics was built. I would say after Jack Kirby and the rest of them, they tried to play the swing for the fences within Marvel Comics, and it really didn't work for them. But once Jim Shooter got in there and made sure everybody passed in all of their material on time and everything ran smoothly, that was Moneyball. Because there was nothing terribly spectacular. It was just meat and potatoes, make sure the customer is happy, and you get them hooked story after story after story. That's what it should be. But that's not what Jonathan Hickman thinks he is part as a writer for Marvel Comics is, nor for any writer within Marvel Comics. They should all be swinging for the fences every time they get up to bat. And why does this tie into what I talked about at the first? Well, because it's part of their ideological mindset, this narcissism that I come first and my feelings are the most important thing, and therefore, when I get up to the plate, I'm thinking about me because it's all about me. No, it's not all about you. It's about the team. And this is why, in part, I think that the old systems of entertainment must die. Because it doesn't matter if they stop bringing in all of this quote-unquote woke stuff, this progressive storytelling, you're still going to have the people in charge and writing and producing this material to be of the exact same mindset. It's all about me, me, me. It's not about giving the customer what they want. It's not about valuing the asset over the long term. And you're still going to get nothing but garbage stories. And to show this, I'm going to talk just very briefly about a couple of other writers and some statements from them that I came across over the last week. By the way, most of this is from This Week in Marvel at marvel.com. I'll try to remember to put the link for that in the description if you want to go listen to the interview with Jonathan Hickman or this other fellow, which I don't even know his name, nor do I really care. But they were also interviewing at marvel.com the writer for the new series of Indian Spider-Man. I don't really know very much about this, except for the fact that there was, at some point in history, a Indian version of Spider-Man, so this guy wants to bring back this Indian version of Spider-Man. But the point was, as he was giving his interview, he talked about how he got to write this series for Marvel. 
And I've gone over this kind of thing many times on my channel, but it's just another confirmation of this. Because this fellow, and again, don't care about his name, really not important. If you want to go look it up, you go ahead. But he was down in the dumps during the time where he had to be locked in his house. I think he's British, but Indian British, if you know what I mean. And he was a script writer, but he was down in the dumps and he really didn't want to do that anymore. And he relates in this video that he was always a big Spider-Man fan. So he just tweeted out one day, I just want to write Spider-Man. And then one of the artists that he works with said, are you serious about this? Because I can hook you up. I can get you in contact with some people from Marvel and I'm sure they'll let you write Spider-Man. And that's exactly what he did. He contacted the people that he knew within Marvel Comics, set up a meeting between him and the people from Marvel Comics. He pitched them, I want to do Indian Spider-Man because he hasn't been done for a while. And they said, yeah, sure, no problem. Go ahead, do that. And now it's coming out from Marvel Comics. And my point about going over that entire thing is this hiring practice is nepotism. Now, it may not be the standard form of nepotism that you usually come across, but that's what it is. Because it's about who you know, not about what you can do. And the reason, again, I bring this up is to point out the double fact that, number one, if it's who you know, then it's about you. Again, what you can do is about reality, or at the very least, what you can do within reality. But nepotism is about you. It's about the individual. And if you have that kind of mindset, and you run a business by that kind of mindset, because the second thing I want to bring up is that this is what is happening right now in Marvel. This comic series is coming out this week in Marvel. So it's still there, even though they're downplaying the quote-unquote progressive, woke nonsense within their comics a little bit. It's still run the same way. So you're going to get garbage in, garbage out. And the last few writers that I want to concentrate on, because it was at a panel at a Comic-Con, and this Comic-Con is FlameCon, by the way. It is a Comic-Con for your alphabet people. And the panel's name is, quite literally, this is what they published, but make it queer. Turning mainstream universes gay, from Gotham to galaxies far, far away. And by the way, I was looking for a recording from this panel. I didn't find it. I'm sure there are plenty of things that I could get into if I had a recording for this entire thing. So if anybody knows where I could find that, just let me know in the comments or send me an email. My email's in the back end of this YouTube channel. Anyways, most of these statements come from an article that covers this panel from Popverse, and it does include people who are fairly prominent writers, I wouldn't say good writers, fairly prominent writers within comic universes right now and other kinds of things. You have Terry Blass, who wrote for Rick and Morty. You have Alyssa Wong, who writes Star Wars for Marvel, I think, and writes Deadpool right now. You have Charlie Jane Anders, who writes New Mutants and Lethal Legion. So they're all on this panel. And I'm just going to pick out a few statements from a couple of them to show you, again, exactly what I'm talking about. One of the statements from Terry Blass was, I would hope that if an editor were to approach me about writing something, they would know that I'm not going to write something that doesn't feel right to me. And Alyssa Wong reiterates this statement by saying, it's about telling the stories we want, not that we are asked to tell. Now, if that statement itself does not put the final nail in everything I've been talking about today, I don't know what will. Because there is the exact statement of what I'm trying to go on about today. It's what's real versus what I want. Because she literally says, it's about telling stories we want, not what we're asked to tell. So they don't want to work as part of the team. They don't want to work for the company, even though the company, I'm sure, is bent towards their way of looking at it to begin with. But no, they're not there for the team. They're there for the I. And Alyssa Wong doubles down on this by making another statement of that kind, saying, I worked with teams where I felt that I had to slide things in under the radar and just hope that my very straight team didn't notice. But I've always worked with groups of people who are not only incredibly supportive, but are like, can we push it even further? Every time I feel like I'm getting away with something and it's really exciting every single time. So the point is that her and the people on this panel, they're all agreeing about the fact that you need to deceive the people around you. You're not working as part of a team. You're getting things in under the radar or you're pushing them even further and you feel like you're getting away with something because you're doing something you know you shouldn't be doing. This is about I. It's not about the team. It's not about the product. And it's certainly not about the audience. It's about what they want to do. 
And by the way, this is not something new. I have covered this in an interview that I covered, what was that, about two years ago, maybe a year and a half. It was about an interview with Bobby Chase. Now, Bobby Chase was one of the editors and chiefs of Marvel during the mid to late 90s. I think it was actually early to mid 90s. And she says in this new interview, which was last year, that when she got hired at Marvel, they specifically told her, check your politics at the door because that's not what our readers want. And she says, quite specifically in that interview, that I nodded my head and thought to myself, that's not what I'm going to do. And she went in there, and she quite specifically states this in the interview, she went in there with a mind to subvert things. That's not working for the team. That's not trying to make a good product. That's not giving the audience what they want. It's doing what I want, just exactly like Alyssa Wong is saying here. So this has been in entertainment for a long time now. We're talking early 90s. So that's 30 years minimum. These people have been subverting and undermining storytelling. Just back in the early 90s, they had to be very subtle about it. Now they're trying to be subtle about it, but when they talk to people of their own stripe, which again, FlameCon is people of their own stripe, they just come right out and say it. And quite honestly, this kind of behavior and these kinds of statements by people like Alyssa Wong and the other people on this panel is going to ensure that when they lose, then they will lose because the pendulum has already begun to swing back. But these kinds of statements ensure the thing that you're starting to see right now. You look within employers and who they're hiring, and they've already done a study to show that if people who are putting in resumes are going to put pronouns in their bio, they're going to automatically discount them from working at the company. Why? Because that shows right from the get-go that everything is going to be about you, not about the company. Not about your employer, not about the product, not about the customer, about you. People are waking up to this, and they're going to ensure that, yeah, this whole gatekeeping that they keep talking about, that they made up within their minds, the quote-unquote progressive mind, that they've been oppressed for so long, and that they're being kept out of comic shops and everything else, yeah, that's going to actually start to happen. Why? Because who in the world would allow someone to work for them if you specifically know that they're going to undermine everything for their own self-interest from the get-go? And this, again, is why I'm saying that these old systems, they're just going to have to be destroyed. You're going to get people playing Moneyball who are going to concentrate on the meat and potatoes, trying to get a single or a double every now and then, and build and build and build until they have a new industry. It's going to be slow and laborious, but it's going to have to be done. Honestly, I'm someone who has built a successful business, and although it's kind of ridiculous me trying to compare my small little business to something like Disney, but at the same time, I know how to build, or I have built, a successful business, and how did I do that? Well, it took me about 10 years of scraping by and making sure I built up a reputation of being quite thorough and dependable. It's not flashy, but it works. And as I did that, I also contributed to a mindset between myself and the customers, my clients, that I could do stuff for them that they weren't going to get anywhere else. I would go over and above for them and make sure that they knew it. And that built and built and built up into a point where they started throwing so much money at me that I had to expand in order to keep up with all of the work. And then it got to a point where it was so much working on its own that I don't really have much to do with it anymore because it became a successful thing on its own in the way that it worked. And it was all built on meat and potatoes. It's all built upon money ball. It's all built upon hit a single or a double. Don't swing for the fences. And how do you do that? Well, honestly, it's through reason and logic. Why? Because it's built on reality. And it's very slow and laborious. Dealing with reality is not a fast-paced thing. And the example that I always use for this is the entertainment example of let's get back to traditional heroes. It's not the sexiest thing in the world, trust me, but it will bring us to that point of greatness that we've seen before. Why? Because as I'm always going on about what is true heroism, I mean true heroism, not this faux or deconstruction or simulacrum of heroism. No, true heroism is 
built up by virtues, those virtues of prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance, and they all come from and are built necessarily upon right reason, that is to say, your reason in accord with reality. And how do you incorporate those virtues into your life? Well, you do it through habit. And habit is the most boring thing in the world. But at the same time, that's how you do it. You deal with habit. You just constantly ingrain this in your life time after time after time, small bit by small bit, making sure that reality is always your grounding. And that's how you get to be heroic. And that's how you get to write a good hero. And that's how you get to build actual things. Honestly, it reminds me of that scene from, I think it's broadcast news, where you had Michael Keaton and Marissa Torme, and she was pregnant with his child, and he was working at a newspaper, and she was going off on him and saying, are you going to be there for this child? And he says, yes, I am. And she goes, well, what happens if someone breaks into our apartment with a gun and puts their gun to my head and says, I'm going to kill you and your child? Where are you going to be? And he says, that's ridiculous. Things don't happen that way. And she said, that's exactly my point. You don't be there for something spectacular in order to save the day. You need to be there in every little instance and in every little thing that he needs in growing up. That's how you be there for your child. That's the same way that you build a business. Why? Because it's built upon the real. You need to be there for the little things. You need to concentrate on the meat and potatoes, on the everyday life. You need to get down and dirty and work at it in order to build up anything spectacular. And you're not going to have any time to rest on your laurels and look back and say, I'm so great. I've swung for the fences. I've built this spectacular thing. No, you're just going to work at it and it's going to happen. Again, based on things like habit and the real, a grounding in reality. And I want to close out all of this by going over something that I ran across while I was looking for this stuff for the video that I wanted to do for this week. So I was going through the timeline of the guy who wrote the piece on FlameCon by Popverse, and he only has one social media tag to his entire name. So I decided to go through his timeline to see if I could find when he actually started to talk about putting out this article. And funny enough, again, this is the whole, it's all about me, not about the team. It wasn't in his timeline when he actually put forth this article for this paper or magazine or website or whatever it really is. How in the world do you write an article for someone and not tell people on your social media? Because I figured some people might have asked in his original post, where can I find videos for this, etc. But again, he didn't even post about it at all. And I searched six ways from Sunday. But the funny thing is that as I was going through his timeline, looking for this specific tweet to see if I could find any links to where the article came from, etc. What did I see? I saw a lot of what I see within my timeline right now. You see the exact same statements as you would go through the right wing, as you would go through the left wing. They're the exact same thing except it's a mirror universe. He even tweeted at somebody because there was a conservative group, I think it's in the UK, talking about keeping wokeness out of science and how they need to guard science and all these people, these quote unquote progressive people were trying to ridicule and smash this idea of keeping wokeness out of science. And he himself posted a faux book cover that says, everything I don't like is woke, which reminds me of that exact thing that's on our side, which people post, which is everything or everyone I don't like is a militaristic 1930s German, which I have to put it that way for the YouTube algorithm. But again, the same statements were there. It's just a mirror universe. They're just logical fallacy after logical fallacy. There's guilt by association saying, well, you see, you do this and these people in history did that. So you're exactly the same. There's equivocation saying, well, define what woke is. And then they define what woke is and say, that's not the actual definition. There's appeal to authority saying, well, you see, the definition on this website is this and they're right. Therefore, I'm appealing to that authority. It's logical fallacy after logical fallacy. And my point being, in stating that this is just a mirror of what I see in my timeline sometimes, is that we need to ensure that if we actually want to build something which is going to extract ourselves from this nonsense we see right now, it has to be based on what is real. It has to be something which is more than ideological. And if we don't, we're going to end up back at this exact same place. Because the facts don't care about our feelings either. 
So, if I've given you anything new to think about, hit like, hit the shield in the lower right-hand corner of your screen to subscribe, and don't forget, there are three links in the description and on the pinned comment, actually two links for my three graphic novels, two superhero graphic novels, and a return to form for low fantasy. It's based upon traditional storytelling, merit-based techniques that have been refined over thousands of years, merit, and stories about true heroism, honor, and everything we need to focus on. So if any of that looks or sounds appealing to you at all, click on those links in the description and go on over and order yourself a copy of one of my graphic novels today. All right, I'll leave it there. I'll see you later. Bye.